after his grandfather passed away. 19-year-old Kazuya Salma, who is a worthless virgin loser, who found himself completely alone with no family left. Suddenly, he's Isekai to the Elfridan Kingdom, a struggling little nation in another world, and is expected to be their hero. But guys, I don't know why this struggling kingdom summoned this asshole to be their hero. The world is in danger because of a war with a demon army, and Kazuya was summoned as part of a deal Elfridan made with its allies to help in the fight. Not happy about being treated like a pawn, Kazuya decides to fix the kingdom's crumbling economy in his own way, not through fighting or adventuring. Knowing his intentions, he's made king of Elfridan and engaged to the princess, but instead this virgin pervert is ended up by creating his harem with a lots of chicks. One day this d***bass was finishing his final exams, a group of magicians cast a forbidden summoning spell. A magic symbol appeared, teleporting him to another world and making him fall from the sky. Just when he thought it was all over and he was going to die of Rijin, he flashed into a room and landed in front of the wizards. But instead of being welcomed, they all looked confused, wondering why their hero had to be so ugly. As he walked into the throne room, everyone stared at him like he was some kind of criminal. The king have a hot queen, named Alicia Elfridan, while the king decided to get real and explain why they summoned him. The kingdom of Elfrin was on a massive continent called Landia, but the demon lord's armies had started attacking nearby countries and taking their land. With all the chaos, the Empire of Chaos demanded that the other nations send them money to boost their military. After hearing this story, he learned more about the continent's history, but he still couldn't figure out what any of this had to do with him. Then, the kingdom's prime minister, Marx, jumped in to explain that their country was broke and couldn't pay the Empire of Chaos. So, when they asked the gods for advice, the only solution was to summon a hero they could offer as a servant to the Empire. Furious, he realized they were planning to hand him over like a slave. It didn't take long before he started to panic, wondering if the Empire would experiment on him like a lab rat. At that point, he seriously started thinking about whether running away was his best option. But when Marx mentioned that the kingdom had top-tier security to protect their walls from invasions, it hit Salma, there was no way he could escape. So, instead of running, he decided to help. He suggested that they build up enough strength to reject the demands of the other kingdoms. But first, they needed to fix the country's financial mess. Once everyone saw he might have a real plan, Salma sat down with Marx and the royal couple to discuss how they could boost Elfrin's economy. After three days of poring over financial reports, King Alfred made a shocking announcement. He was stepping down and handing over the kingdom's affairs to Salma. On top of that, he declared that his daughter, Lycia, would marry the new king. Word of Salma's sudden rise to the throne spread fast across the nation. When Lycia heard this bizarre news, she rushed to the palace, thinking that this so-called hero had somehow tricked her clueless dad into giving up the throne. But when she arrived, Lycia was stunned to hear from Alfred himself that he had willingly chosen Salma to be the new king because he believed the young man would be a better ruler than he ever was. Not happy with that answer, Lycia stormed off to meet this new king. When she entered the room, Salma thought she was another bitch, who has came here to congrats him and tries to play with his joystick. But Lycia, full of pride, introduced herself as the rightful heir to the throne, accusing him of being an imposter. Salma calmly explained that her father had forced him into becoming king, and that he only accepted to save himself from being turned into a slave by the Chaos Empire. He even told her that he was fine with cancelling the wedding if she wanted. Hearing this, Lycia apologized, realizing she had no idea how useless her father was. She then asked Salma what his plan was to raise the money needed to pay off their debt to the Grand Chaos Empire. Salma told Lycia that he had already gathered the money by selling some of the kingdom's precious jewels to a young jewelry merchant from the country of Adonia. At first, Lycia was furious when she heard this because those jewels were considered national treasures. However, Salma explained that he had only sold the ones that didn't hold much value in terms of the kingdom's status. When she asked if he had already sent the money, Salma admitted that he was holding off on making the payment for now. Lycia then suggested using the money to strengthen their military instead. But Salma told her it would be smarter to spend it on providing food and basic necessities for the people to avoid a potential rebellion. At first, Lycia couldn't believe her citizens would ever rebel. Salma explained that when people are starving, their first priority is survival, not loyalty. If they're hungry, they won't care about anything else. Hearing this, Lycia realized that Salma truly was a realist, and she began to trust that he might actually be able to save their kingdom. After one month of being king, Salma realized that much of the kingdom's technology relied heavily on magic, 
and transportation was primarily done using giant mythical creatures. While in the throne room, the high priest approached Salma and advised him to take a magical test to see if he had gained any powers when he was summoned. They went to a small prayer room where the priest told Salma to place his hand on the head of an ancient gargoyle, which would confirm his magical aura and reveal what kind of powers he had. After performing the ritual, Salma was unsure how to use his newly discovered abilities, so he simply returned to his usual work. Not long after, Lycia decided to surprise him with a visit. However, when she entered his office, she was startled to see three feather pens floating and writing notes all on their own. Salma explained that he was controlling the pens with magic, as his new powers allowed him to transfer his consciousness into multiple nearby objects and control them independently. Lycia found this ability a bit creepy, but Salma, trying to lighten her mood, he said, it is also very useful tonight. But then, Salma quickly switched gears, saying his new powers actually made handling paperwork a lot easier. When Lycia asked what he and the staff were busy with, Salma explained that they were going through the kingdom's financial records, trying to track down tax evaders and any cases of misused funds. By recovering stolen money and arresting corrupt officials, they hoped to boost the kingdom's revenue. Lycia was stunned that he was putting in so much effort for a country he hadn't even grown up in. The next morning, Salma looked like a corporate zombie, exhausted from pulling an all-nighter shift. I think guys he is also stuck inside the Matrix. The Matrix is everywhere. It is all around us. However, when he noticed that Lycia and the rest of his staff were fast asleep, standing up, he took a moment to look at his future bride, sitting down beside her on the couch, imagining how to play with her melons on their honeymoon. Sorry guys I mean he admired the graceful curve of her back and her golden brown hair because he loved the blonde girls and also guys do you like blonde girls tell me in the comment and I will give you one. Gently, he touched a strand of hair on her face, causing her to stir. When Lycia woke up and saw him sitting there, she quickly felt awkward and asked what he was doing. Not wanting to come off as creepy, Salma casually invited her to join him on a short journey. During the ride, Lycia teased him for not knowing how to ride a horse. Salma, in his usual playful manner, joked that while he couldn't ride a horse, he could teach her to ride something else later. As they traveled, Lycia asked if he had left behind any family or a girlfriend in his previous world. Salma revealed that he didn't have anyone, which seemed to make her feel relieved. When they finally arrived at their destination, Salma explained that the kingdom's food shortage was due to most farmers switching to growing cash crops like cotton. This shift happened when the demons began attacking the continent. Countries far from the threat, including Elfrin, saw an opportunity and started exporting more cotton. However, when almost half of the supercontinent Landia began producing cotton, the market became flooded, prices crashed, and many farmers couldn't make a profit anymore, forcing them to quit farming altogether. Lycia felt guilty for not knowing this, but Salma reassured her. He told her to cheer up, saying he was only teaching her all of this now so she could become an even better ruler than him in the future. Back at the castle, Salma and Lycia sat down for breakfast while discussing how to tackle the hunger problem. Salma insisted that they encourage farmers to return to planting food crops instead of cotton. He also suggested that the food grown in their farmlands should be sold to citizens at a lower price to make it more accessible. As they spoke, a young man with long blonde hair approached their table. Lycia introduced him to Salma as Ludwin Arks, the current commander of the Royal Guard. Ludwin joined them for breakfast, and after some conversation, he asked Salma if he was having any issues with his duties as king. Salma admitted that he needed more skilled people on his team. Lycia then suggested that he announce a job application to the general public of Elfred and using a special communication tool reserved for the king called the Gemstone Broadcaster. She also recommended excluding citizens without formal education from applying. But Salma, needing as much help as possible, insisted that everyone should be allowed to try. To motivate the masses to join his cause, Salma decided to use a famous quote from a legendary Chinese warlord, General Ku, who was known for his ability to gather talented people under his leadership. With that in mind, Salma prepared an inspiring speech, and as citizens all across the kingdom gathered to listen, he laid out his vision for rebuilding the kingdom through a new set of strategic policies. His words were meant to spark hope and inspire people to come forward and help him in his mission to restore Elfriden. However, Salma knew he couldn't make any of these plans happen without a skilled workforce. So, he urged every talented individual, no matter their social status, to apply for a chance to join his royal council. To sweeten the deal, he promised that the finalists of this talent hunt would receive a prestigious royal certificate of Elfriden along with a hefty sack of gold as a reward. 
The next morning, Lysia woke up, reflecting on everything Salma had told her the previous day. She even found herself daydreaming about starting a family with him. Her thoughts were interrupted by a knock on the door, and her handmaiden entered, informing her it was time to get dressed for the royal event. Meanwhile, in the throne room, Salma sat on his majestic chair, with Marx, Ludwin, and Lysia standing before him as the finalists knelt in respect. However, one of the contestants, a dark elf named Aisha, refused to bow, stating it was against her customs. Ludwin, ready to punish her for the defiance, was about to act, but Salma stopped him, saying it was fine and ordered the rest of the contestants to stand. As the entire kingdom watched the grand event, Marx began to announce the unique talents of each contestant. The first finalist called forward was Aisha Edgard, whose people lived in a secluded magical forest. Using his powers, Salma learned more about her tribe. According to Marx, Aisha was a highly skilled fighter, unmatched by any warrior in the country. However, Aisha had something else in mind. She said she wanted a different kind of reward, and Ludwin, misunderstanding her, thought she was referring to something more inappropriate, and tried to rush forward. But Salma quickly stopped him from acting impulsively. Aisha clarified that instead of a cash prize, she wanted Salma to use his wisdom to help her community, which had been struggling with a serious issue. Her tribe's forests were drying up. After some thought, Salma deduced that the forest was likely drying up because larger trees were blocking sunlight from reaching the smaller plants and shrubs. He explained that the best solution would be for her tribe to regularly cut down some of the larger trees to allow sunlight to reach the lower layers of the forest, preventing further damage and avoiding natural disasters. Aisha was deeply impressed by Salma's quick thinking and practical solution. Moved by his wisdom and kindness, she knelt down and pledged her eternal loyalty to him. Salma promised Aisha he would visit her tribe one day and teach them everything he had just explained. Marx then called the next finalist, a beautiful woman from Lagoon City named Juna. As Juna walked with her bouncy balls, I don't know why I stopped my editing for one hour, Salma couldn't help but be drawn to her beauty and I bet you guys he is also thinking, how to add this bitch to his hearing. Noticing this, Lysia coughed and turned away. Marx introduced Juna as not only the most beautiful woman in Landia, but also an incredible singer. But I was thinking how she sounds in the night. I am the one, the way your son don't need Sorry guys, I mean with a voice inherited from her mermaid ancestors. Salma was impressed and asked her to perform an uplifting song for the crowd. But Juna admitted she only knew modern songs from her world. To fix the issue, Salma took out his smartphone, surprising everyone. He handed her a pair of earbuds, allowing Juna to listen to a song from his world. Once she heard the tune, Juna sang with incredible emotion her voice capturing the hearts of everyone, much like a famous artist. Her performance was so captivating that the men in the crowd couldn't help but cheer, enchanted by both her talent and her beauty. Salma thanked Juna for delivering a performance worthy of a Grammy, clearly impressed by her talent. Juna smiled and expressed her interest in learning more songs from his world, eager to expand her musical repertoire with the unique tunes from where he came from. Marx then called the next finalist, an overweight man from the village of Pot named Poncho. As the plus-size contestant stepped forward, he tripped and fell flat on his face, causing a bit of laughter. Getting back up, Marx announced that Poncho's unique talent was his ability to eat an unlimited amount of food, far more than any normal person. Additionally, Poncho was well-versed in exotic dishes from across the continent. Upon hearing this, Salma leapt from his seat and declared Poncho the most talented person in the room, much to everyone's surprise. When Poncho heard Salma's praise, he immediately burst into tears, but Salma reassured him, saying that his eating skills could save the entire kingdom. Salma then gave him the royal title of Chef Supreme. After Poncho, Marx introduced the next finalist, a mysterious man named Hakuya, who stepped forward dressed in a black kimono with striking purple eyes. Marx revealed that Hakuya was one of the smartest men on the planet, with an IQ comparable to that of Einstein. He also mentioned that it was Hakuya's uncle who encouraged him to apply for this competition. Salma offered Hakuya the role of royal librarian, but to his surprise, Hakuya respectfully declined, saying he preferred to serve as the kingdom's military advisor instead. Shocked, Salma asked why he would want such a demanding position. Hakuya explained that he had developed great respect for Salma after witnessing how he treated Poncho, whom most people would dismiss due to his unusual talent. Salma's acceptance of Poncho's abilities had impressed Hakuya, leading him to believe Salma was worthy of his loyalty. Struck by Hakuya's intelligence and poise, Salma decided to conduct a special aptitude test to see if Hakuya was truly fit for the role of military advisor. Finally, it was time for the last finalist. 
marks introduce Tomo, a beast girl from an ancient wolf tribe with the rare ability to communicate with animals. While Salma was still considering how to utilize her unique talent, the shy girl timidly spoke up, saying she had something important to tell him. However, her voice was so soft that Salma could barely hear her. He stood up and moved closer to Tomo, gently encouraging her not to be nervous. After calming down, she leaned in and whispered a secret into Salma's ear. Though the information shocked him to the core, he kept his composure, pretending as though it was nothing out of the ordinary. After the ceremony for the finalists, Salma and his trusted advisors gathered in his office along with Tomo, the beast girl. Salma revealed a shocking truth to them. Tomo could not only communicate with animals, but also deadly demons. This took everyone by surprise since demons, being a highly advanced species, were known to speak a completely different language from humans. Tomo explained that a few months prior, she had encountered a wolf demon while playing in the forest, and surprisingly, the demon didn't attack her. While Lycia and the others found it hard to believe, Salma reassured them it was true. He went on to say that if they could find more demons for Tomo to talk to, they might be able to bring an end to the war without further bloodshed. Despite this hopeful possibility, Salma warned that her ability made her a target for other nations, who could try to abduct her to use her powers for their own benefit. Ludwin agreed, recalling how Elfreden had once been at war with the neighboring nation of Amania, and Marx, as the elder statesman, confirmed that these rivalries could indeed be dangerous. As Tomo timidly took Lycia's hand, it was clear that Lycia was feeling nervous. Sensing her discomfort, Salma changed the subject, telling Tomo that her abilities were a gift to the world, not a burden. Salma then knelt in front of Tomo, promising that they would protect her at all costs within the safety of the castle walls. However, Tomo didn't fully grasp why all this protection was necessary. Salma asked Ludwin to assign guards to watch over her, but Mark suggested that such obvious security would only draw unwanted attention from outsiders who might question her importance. Marx proposed a solution. The best way to ensure Tomo's safety would be for Salma and Lycia to marry and officially adopt Tomo as their daughter, thereby elevating her status to royalty. Since Salma and Lycia weren't ready to admit their feelings for each other, Salma instead suggested that King Alfred and the queen adopt Tomo as their own child. Lycia, thrilled at the idea of gaining a little sister, rushed over to hug Tomo, but Tomo gently pulled away, explaining that she already had a family, her mother and little brother, who lived far from the castle. Salma comforted her, telling Tomo that, as an adopted royal, she could invite her family to live in the castle with her. This reassurance helped Tomo feel at ease, and she agreed to go along with their plan. Salma told Marx to keep the adoption a secret for about a month to prevent raising suspicion. In the meantime, to help Tomo's presence at the castle seem natural, Salma made her the caretaker of the royal stables, a position she gladly accepted with a smile. A few weeks after their little meeting, while Salma was in his room sewing a strange ninja doll, Lycia mentioned that Tomo had finally begun accepting them as her second family. Just then, Lycia's handmaiden walked in, noticing how close the two were sitting. She giggled softly before closing the door, leaving them to finish their moment. Moments later, she returned to inform Salma that Poncho had come back from his food exploration trip. Excited, Salma grabbed Lycia's hand and pulled her along, while the handmaiden stood by, smiling at the sight. At the dining hall, they met Poncho, who had traveled across the country on a dragon, collecting the most exotic and unique foods from various regions. When Lycia asked what he planned to do with all the food, Salma only teased her by saying it was a surprise. A few hours later, Juna and Poncho announced to the kingdom that the castle was hosting an exotic buffet. Salma explained to the people that the event was set up to show different meal options while they worked on solving the kingdom's food shortage. Lycia and the other ladies would serve as judges for the buffet. When Poncho revealed the first dish, a squishy little octopus, the girls were creeped out. But Salma quickly chopped it up into small pieces, grilling it into crispy squid kebabs. Once they tried it, the girls couldn't resist the delicious taste, all asking for second helpings. Next, Poncho presented a plate of slender wood sticks. While most of the girls weren't excited, Aisha recognized it as a delicacy from her homeland. Salma sliced the sticks into thin chips, seasoning them with salt and sugar. To everyone's surprise, the chips turned out crispy and flavorful, winning over the judges. The next dish Poncho introduced was a plate of locusts, which grossed out most of the girls. However, Tomo boldly took a big bite out of one and exclaimed how much she loved it. Poncho explained that he had used a special spice from Tomo's village called mash water to prepare the dish, and Salma wondered if it was similar to soy sauce back on Earth. When he tried it, Salma was overwhelmed with emotion 
the familiar taste of spices reminding him of home, bringing tears of joy to his eyes. As the buffet continued, Poncho rolled out the final dish of the day, a slime creature. Slimes were weak monsters usually hunted by beginner adventurers, but no one had ever thought to turn them into food. Aisha and the other girls were surprised the slime retained its jelly-like texture, and they asked Poncho how he managed to do that since dead slimes typically turned into liquid goo. Poncho explained that he had learned a special preservation method from a tribe, which involved smashing the slime's nucleus but leaving its body intact. He then squished the slime, rolled it flat, and chopped it into noodle-like pieces before boiling them with spices. Though skeptical, Salma tried the slime spaghetti and, to his shock, found it tasted like Chinese noodles, despite the odd appearance. So, after Salma enjoyed the slime dish, Aisha and the others joined in, and to their surprise, they loved it too. The country folk were just as excited about this creative new food option, and after Poncho and Juna wrapped up the exotic food showcase, everyone left inspired with new ways to combat hunger. A week later, while Salma was snacking on some locust treats in his office, Lysia's maid came in to inform him that Marx had requested a formal meeting in the throne room. When Salma arrived, he found Marx and Hakuya kneeling before him. To his surprise, Marx announced that he was ready to step down as prime minister, just like Albert had done and passed the title to a younger leader. When Salma asked who would take his place, Marx confidently stated that no one was better suited for the role than Hakuya. Salma agreed and made Hakuya the new prime minister, though he asked Marx to remain on the council to help with the kingdom's political affairs. The elder elf graciously accepted. Being a quick thinker, Hakuya immediately jumped into his new role, advising Salma to take a break from his kingly duties. He explained that if Salma took a day off, it would encourage the rest of the staff to rest as well. Hakuya even suggested that Salma should spend the day going on a date with Lysia. Though Salma wasn't quite ready to take such a bold step with Lysia, Marx supported the idea, even humorously suggesting that he take Aisha along as well. I don't guys what they are talking about guys, tell me in the comments. However, when Salma stepped outside to gather Lysia and Aisha for their day out, he was shocked to find the two of them locked in a heated sword fight, battling over who should get the first knight with him. Aisha launched her tornado blade jutsu at Lysia, but the princess swiftly dodged and countered with her killer frost technique. Salma watched in disbelief as the two nearly destroyed the area with their powers. To stop them from causing more chaos, Salma commanded them to end their duel immediately. After they calmed down, he told them that they were all going on a date together, explaining that it was Hakuya's idea. Aisha suggested they visit her village, but Salma reminded her that they only had one day off, and her village was too far away. Aisha then playfully tried to convince Salma to ditch Lysia, and have some fun with her in his room instead. But Lysia shot him a death glare, so Salma quickly clarified that it was just a friendly date. To blend in with the public, they all changed into school uniforms. Salma complimented Lysia on her outfit but jokingly told Aisha that she looked better in her battle suit. As they rode through the city, Salma reminded the girls to keep their identities a secret and asked them to call him by his second name, Kazuya, for the rest of the day. They disembarked and explored different parts of the town, enjoying the simple life of regular citizens. After some time, they sat down to take a break and talk about how peaceful it felt to experience life as normal people. Suddenly, Aisha interrupted the conversation, claiming she was in the middle of a hunger emergency, so the group rushed over to Juna's cafe for a quick lunch. Salma, using code names, spoke to Juna, who quickly caught on to their attempt at keeping their identities hidden. She served them some slime spaghetti, which they all enjoyed. While chatting with Juna, Lysia frowned and accused Salma of treating Juna differently from the rest of them. Salma, caught off guard, jokingly blamed it on the fact that Juna was so gorgeous. Everyone then turned their teasing toward Aisha, calling her a former warrior turned glutton. Aisha, feeling a little defensive, wondered if her eating habits were why Salma hadn't brought her into his room. Salma, however, reassured her that it had nothing to do with that, reminding her that he was engaged to Lysia. Shocked by this revelation, the girls turned to Salma, explaining that in their world, men and women could have multiple partners. Lysia even chimed in, saying that if Salma truly wanted some extra bitches, she wouldn't mind sharing him with a few other bitches. Salma, unable to help himself, briefly fantasized about such a life surrounded by a harem, but his daydream was cut short by the sound of a couple arguing at a nearby table. Noticing that the girl had pointy ears, Salma quickly realized she was a half-wolf. However, Lysia corrected Salma, pointing out that the girl was actually a high fox, evident by her fluffy tail. Juna playfully warned Salma that mistaking a fox for a wolf could easily start a war. 
Lycia then identified the man as Halbert Magna, the eldest son of the Magna family and a notorious hothead who had attended the same school as her. She said that while Halbert was great at riding horses was his true talent. When Salma asked about the fox girl, Lycia admitted she didn't know much about her, but Juna explained that the girl was Keed Foxia, a powerful mage working under the special ops unit of the armed forces. Keed was pleading with Halbert not to join forces with Duke Carmine, the leader of his state, warning that the Duke was planning to rally soldiers for a rebellion against the new king, Salma. Despite her warnings, Halbert was determined to join the Duke's army, claiming he wanted to learn more about the art of war. Keed, however, urged him to listen to his father and return home instead, explaining that Duke Carmine's decision to start a rebellion during an ongoing war was reckless and would only leave the kingdom vulnerable to attacks from rival nations. As Salma listened to their conversation, it reminded him of a similar discussion he had with Hakuya about the nations surrounding Elfreden and the potential threat of an attack. Hakuya had pointed out that the demon lord's invasion of Landia had made many leaders hostile, and none of the neighboring countries were interested in peace. To the south of Elfreden was the nation of Turgis, known for migrating north during harsh winters, which could lead them to invade soon. To the west was the mercenary nation of Amania, notorious for selling soldiers to the highest bidder, which could potentially incite a deadly civil war in Elfreden. Back in the present, Keed continued trying to convince Halbert that he was making a grave mistake. But Halbert, stubborn as ever, declared that fighting alongside Duke Carmine would make him the next great duke. He added that many noble families were against the new king's rule, but Keed countered, explaining that only those accused of corruption had joined Carmine's cause. Halbert argued that the king was inexperienced compared to the dukes, but Keed defended Salma, saying he was far more capable, thanks to his brilliant talent hunt initiative. Their conversation abruptly stopped when Keed noticed Salma standing right in front of them. They quickly moved into a private room in the cafe. Keed apologized for Halbert's behavior, but he still hadn't realized that Salma was the king, instead thinking Salma was one of Keed's ex-lovers. Halbert, clueless, tried to calm Salma down, even telling Keed to shut up when she attempted to intervene. When Halbert moved to attack Salma, Aisha swiftly stood up and grabbed his face, squeezing it in her powerful hand. Salma told her to let him go, but even after being freed, Halbert still didn't recognize him. To make things clear, Salma sat down in his chair, adopting a regal posture and deepening his voice. Halbert's expression changed as he realized his mistake, quickly hiding behind Keed for protection. Salma reassured him that there was no need to be afraid, as he wasn't going to punish him for siding with Duke Carmine. However, the king warned Halbert that by aligning with the duke, he was setting himself against Keed if a civil war ever broke out for the throne. Salma advised Halbert to think carefully about his decision. When Keed flashed Halbert a sweet smile, he knew that supporting Salma was the only way to protect his beloved. After the tension at the cafe settled, Salma, Lycia, and Aisha returned to enjoying their day off. Aisha, however, soon fell asleep, snoring loudly like a dumb ass. Lycia suggested to Salma that he rest his head on her lap. At first, he was shocked by the offer, but when Lycia joked that she was compensating for her lack of mature melons, Salma felt bad for her and decided to accept. As they relaxed, Lycia asked if he was ready to get engaged. Salma replied that he could only marry someone he truly loved. Lycia smiled and said that if it was meant to be, the universe would find a way to bring them together. Later, back at the castle, Salma was showing off his latest invention to Lycia when her maid, Serena, entered the room to inform the king that visitors were waiting for him in the throne room. When Salma arrived, he was surprised to see Keed, Halbert, and Halbert's father, Glaive Magna, who had come to apologize for his son's behavior. Glaive explained that after hearing about the incident from Keed, he had ordered his soldiers to discipline Halbert. Salma playfully teased Halbert about his bruised face, but assured Glaive that his son was already forgiven. Because of Keed's wisdom during the incident at the cafe, Salma decided to promote her to the rank of royal guard. He also instructed Halbert to leave the army and join the special ops unit as Keed's replacement, so the two could spend more time together. After these announcements, Glaive suddenly mentioned that he had something important to discuss with Salma in private. Respectfully, everyone else left the throne room, giving Glaive and the king space to talk. While Salma and Glaive spoke in private, Lycia and the others took a tea break. Serena playfully teased Lycia, suggesting she could learn a thing or two from Keed and Halbert's relationship. After working tirelessly to improve the kingdom, Salma decided it was time to have a little fun. 
he transferred his consciousness into a toy ninja he had created and used the mascot to patrol the city. Nabu the ninja joined an adventurer squad, and with his impressive reputation preceding him, the team eagerly accepted him into their group. While exploring a hidden dungeon, the squad was astonished by Nabu's swift takedowns of dangerous creatures like basilisks and demon spiders. However, when they encountered a massive salamander that spat deadly acid, it became clear they were outmatched. The group scattered in fear, trying to dodge the creature's burning spit. As they fled, Nabu stumbled and fell, leaving him exposed. A girl from the team quickly stepped in, tossing a flash bomb to distract the salamander. With the creature in a frenzy, Nabu shielded the girl from its attack, then picked her up and ran out of the dungeon. Once outside, the other members saw Nabu and the girl in a heated discussion and were puzzled at how she was able to understand his strange way of communicating. Later that night, while Salma was cleaning his toy ninja, Lycia unexpectedly walked into the room and was surprised to see how much larger the mascot had become. Salma explained that he had commissioned a local craftsman to make a bigger version of Nabu so he could use it to explore the secret passages hidden within the kingdom. A week later, Salma held a meeting in the throne room with his staff. He thanked them for their dedication, acknowledging how much they had sacrificed by giving up their social lives to help him complete all the paperwork. He praised them for their legendary commitment and announced that their efforts had finally secured enough funds for an exciting new mega-project. As a reward for their hard work, Salma told them they could enjoy unlimited PG grape juice for the rest of the day, to which the men cheered for their Gen Z king. Later, on the castle balcony, Lycia asked Salma about the project, and he revealed his plan to build a new city that would serve as a port for incoming goods. Lycia pointed out that they already had a seaport, but Salma explained that this new one would also act as a tourist attraction, boosting revenue for the kingdom. He added that, with the ongoing hunger problem, a land port would greatly improve the distribution of goods across the nation and lower food prices. As they moved into his office, Lycia scolded him gently for overworking himself, concerned about his constant focus on the kingdom's affairs. Salma smirked as Lycia expressed concern, teasing her by saying she was only complaining because he hadn't done all that hard work on her back instead. Lycia, taken aback, reiterated that she was genuinely worried about his health. Salma, brushing off her concern, joked that she should summon another her to keep f***ing her. I mean keep company her, if she felt lonely. Despite his teasing and harsh words, Salma soon fell asleep. Lycia, ignoring his remarks, moved closer and whispered sweet words into his ear, giving him a soft kiss on the cheek before drifting off herself. The next day, Salma and his group traveled to the town of Parnam, the site of the future land port. They were greeted by Ludwin, who was overseeing the project's coordination. However, Ludwin reported a problem with the construction. When they gathered to discuss it, he explained that some of the locals were against building the port on their land. The villagers believed in an old myth that a powerful sea god would destroy their homes with massive waves if any structure was ever built on that specific spot. Intrigued by the story, Salma asked Ludwin to take him to the village leader. When they arrived, the elderly man was initially grumpy and dismissive, but his demeanor quickly changed when he realized Salma was the king. The village leader echoed what Ludwin had said, that the villagers feared the wrath of a sea god. Upon returning to the castle, Salma called for Hakuya to discuss the situation. Salma explained that, while there was no sea god, the myth was based on some truth, as the village had been destroyed by tsunamis in the distant past. Ludwin, confused, remarked that he had never heard of such disasters in the area. Salma explained that tsunamis are rare, sometimes taking hundreds of years to reoccur, but there was still a small risk. For this reason, Salma decided to change the location of the land port project acknowledging the 1% chance of a tsunami happening within their lifetime. As Lycia observed the conversation, she found herself falling more for Salma's charm and practicality. She quietly asked Aisha to help her ensure the king was always happy and well supported. The location for the land port project was eventually changed, and work resumed as normal. However, Halbert wasn't too happy about having to dig up the ground alongside his special ops comrades. He complained that the special ops unit was meant for more important, high-ranking missions, but Keed quickly shut him down, telling him to stop whining and get back to work if he wanted any Foxy Styles later. After their shift, they headed to the guest room for a quick snack, and Halbert, while munching on a hamburger, remarked that he had never tasted anything so delicious before. Because she admired the king, Keed told Halbert that it was Salma who had come up with the idea for the meal, using spices created by the Half-Wolf tribe. 
She went on to praise Salma, saying he was the most capable ruler Elfredon had ever had, and his land port project would help solve the kingdom's hunger and inflation issues. The two lovebirds were about to enjoy a donut and sausage break when Salma and Lycia entered the guest room. Halbert immediately stood up and greeted Salma with formal respect. But Salma, seeing through the act, told him to drop the fake politeness, it didn't suit his rebellious nature. He even told Halbert that from now on, he should feel free to call him by his first name. As they walked back to the construction site, Lycia marveled at the road work being done. Salma explained that the process involved coating the ground with a special concrete material. She also noticed some peculiar trees planted along the road and asked about them. He chimed in, explaining that they were special trees from her forest village, meant to keep monsters and wild animals away. The trees were planted a few centimeters apart to prevent dangerous creatures from gathering in one spot and attacking villagers. As they continued chatting about nature, a mysterious blue bird suddenly flew toward them at high speed. Teed identified it as a Kai, a messenger bird with special abilities. The bird landed softly on Aisha's arm, but when she opened the message, Aisha was horrified to see it was from her father, describing how half of their village had been destroyed by a terrible flood. She explained that many of her kin had lost their lives in the disaster. After taking a moment to think, Salma quickly ordered Keed to send their best men to Aisha's village immediately to assist with the situation. He reassured Aisha to stay strong despite the tragedy unfolding in her homeland. After the devastating news, Salma instructed Lycia to return to the castle and send soldiers along with survival supplies to the Dark Elf village. When he asked Aisha about the distance to her forest, she explained it was a two-day journey. Concerned that they wouldn't make it in time to save the remaining survivors, Salma and Halbert brainstormed ways to move faster. Spotting a monster rhino crossing the street, Salma quickly decided to use the massive creatures as transportation. By evening, they arrived at Aisha's village. Upon their arrival, Salma greeted Aisha's father, Wadden Udgard, and asked him to explain what had happened. Wadden revealed that the flood occurred in the eastern part of the village and that many elves were still missing. Salma instructed Wadden to gather the names of the missing and to organize a watch team to alert them in case of another disaster. Aisha, eager to help, pleaded with Salma to let her take charge of the watch party, and Salma agreed, unable to refuse her determination. Salma then gave a brief but motivational speech to the rescue squad, urging them to act quickly. The team immediately set to work, digging through the rubble to find survivors. While digging alongside Halbert, Salma heard a faint noise coming from beneath a tree stump. With Halbert's help, they uncovered an unconscious elf girl. The rescue team rushed to tend to her, and Halbert was impressed by Salma's sharp senses. Salma, however, explained that he had been using a toy mouse controlled by his magic to aid in the search. Later, when they returned to Wadden's hut, Wadden thanked Salma for arriving in time to help, although many of the recovered elves hadn't responded to treatment. Aisha entered the hut, announcing that Lycia had arrived with backup and survival supplies. However, Wadden's brother, Rothler, expressed his frustration, saying that everything they were doing was pointless. Salma tried to reassure him, explaining that rebuilding the village and providing food would make a difference. But Rothler remained bitter, stating that nothing they did could bring the dead back to life. Wadden apologized for his brother's harsh words, explaining that Rothler had lost both his wife and daughter in the flood. Wadden tried to console Rothler by encouraging him to focus on the good memories, but Rothler collapsed, weeping, which made Salma feel as though he had failed in some way. Before they left the village, Aisha confided in Salma, revealing that her uncle, Rothler, had been one of those who refused to cut down some of the trees in the forest. She asked if his plan to thin the trees might have prevented the disaster. Salma, while sympathetic, admitted that although the chances might have been better, there was no way to be certain, as such things are ultimately governed by nature. On the way back, Lycia confided in Salma that she felt useless for not being able to help rescue any of the elves. Salma reassured her, saying that she had done a lot by providing the survival packages, which had saved many lives. However, Salma admitted he felt like he had failed the country by not ensuring that every state had the right materials and support to withstand natural disasters. That night, Juna visited Salma in his room. Noticing how stressed he was from all the paperwork, she gently rubbed his forehead with her soft hand, trying to comfort him. She urged him not to hide his feelings from her, like he often did with Lycia and the others. Juna even hinted that he could call on her whenever he was feeling lonely. But before she could finish, she realized that Salma had already fallen asleep. Smiling, she whispered a soothing mermaid love spell in his ear, and then sang him a gentle lullaby to help him rest. Meanwhile, at Duke Carmine's estate, Carmine and other rebel leaders gathered for an emergency meeting to discuss their strategy for defeating Salma and taking over the kingdom. 
Excel Walter, the Duchess of Lagoon City, argued that starting a civil war while other countries were eyeing the kingdom would be foolish. Duke Castor Vargas of Vargas City mentioned that the nation of Adonia had promised military support, but Excel was skeptical, pointing out that they could have made the same promise to Salma. She asked Carmine why he was so determined to overthrow Salma, especially considering the progress the young king had made in reviving the country. Carmine, the intimidating lion-like figure, growled that Salma, being a foreigner, didn't understand the customs and traditions of Elfredon, making him unfit to rule. Ixel accused him of wanting the throne for himself, but Carmine insisted his only goal was to return Albert to the throne. In the midst of their debate, Carla, Castor's daughter, entered the room, declaring her intention to join the war because she believed Salma had reduced Lycia to a royal side chick. Carmine agreed to accept Adonia's support, and news of this decision reached Gaius, the king of Ammonia. Gaius ordered his son, Julius, to prepare for the invasion of Elfridon, with plans to reclaim lands that had once been taken from them. Back at the castle, Hakuya informed Salma that the landport project had significantly improved food distribution, and now it was time to focus on their next big strategy. Salma knew he might have to declare war against the three rebellious dukes if they continued to openly defy him, though he hoped to avoid violence. But when he thought about his duty to protect Lycia and the others, Salma reluctantly told Hakuya to prepare for the possibility of a civil war. Meanwhile, in Amania, Gaius gathered his troops in the throne room and announced that it was time to reclaim the land that Elfredon had stolen from them many years ago. As Gaius rallied his men, Colbert, the Minister of Finance, interrupted and pleaded with the king to delay his war plans, warning that an invasion could cost their nation a lot of money. Enraged, Gaius kicked Colbert with his metal boot, but the minister, despite the pain, reminded the king that invading Elfredon would violate the peace treaty set by the Chaos Empire. Furious, Gaius drew his sword, ready to execute Colbert for his defiance. Julius suddenly stepped in between Gaius and Colbert, telling the minister that Elfredon had not yet signed the peace treaty. Colbert tried to argue, but Gaius silenced him, declaring that he would no longer serve as the kingdom's finance minister. Back in his office, Salma discussed his plans with Lycia, preparing to fight against the dukedoms. They then headed to the castle conference room for a virtual meeting with the three state leaders. After introducing himself, Salma gave them an ultimatum, join his side by midnight, or be treated as traitors to the crown. Excel asked him to explain his plan and Salma revealed that he intended to unify all of the nation's armed forces under a single command, one that would take orders solely from the king. Castor insulted him, saying that the reason the forces were divided was to prevent the king from becoming too powerful and turning rogue. Salma responded that such old tactics wouldn't work in the current age, and the best way to defeat enemy nations was to have a unified battle squad under one command. Excel inquired about the new land port, and Salma reassured her that it would not interfere with the seaport in her city. Convinced by his words, Excel knelt and declared her loyalty to the king. However, Castor, stubborn as ever, refused to submit, saying he would rather fight and die in battle than take orders from a young king. Salma then turned his attention to Carmine and asked why he had rebelled. The Lion Man General bluntly replied that he was following his instincts as a military leader. Salma called Carmine a fool for choosing to fight against him but Carmine confidently stated that he was wise enough to make his own decisions. In frustration, Salma told him to choke on a hairball. The conversation ended with Salma declaring a basic rule of war. Whoever defeated the other's forces would take control of their army. Both Castor and Carmine agreed to these terms, preparing for the inevitable battle. As the virtual conference came to a close and Carmine was about to leave, Lycia called him back. In front of everyone, she drew her blade and cut off her hair as a symbol of her unwavering loyalty to Salma. After the meeting, Salma expressed his gratitude to Excel for siding with him, and he also thanked Juna, Excel's granddaughter, for helping to solidify the partnership. The following day, Gaius and his army marched into the city of Altamura, where they captured the mayor, Weiss. Gaius demanded that Weiss hand over the city. And being a coward, the mayor agreed, begging Gaius for time to convince the citizens not to resist the powerful forces of Amania. Julius, Gaius's son, advised his father to accept the mayor's request, reasoning that it would spare their men from unnecessary losses. Gaius promised to protect Weiss if he delivered the city by the next day. Meanwhile, outside of Randall Castle, Keed, Halbert, and the special ops team had set up a fortress overnight. Carmine's soldiers launched an attack 
and Halbert responded with a fiery spear, striking at the enemy forces. He was alarmed to see that Carmine's men were equipped with cannons, a threat she hadn't prepared for since her defenses were built to withstand magical attacks. When the first cannonball nearly broke through the fortress walls, Keed and Halbert ducked for cover, worried about the ongoing assault. Suddenly, a dark elf appeared, shooting down one of the cannonballs with his mystic arrow. The elf introduced himself to Halbert as Sir, the father of the elf girl Salma and Halbert had saved during the landslide rescue. Out of gratitude and to prove his bravery to his daughter, Sir decided to join the special ops unit and assist the king in defeating his enemies. With Sir's help, most of the enemy cannonballs were destroyed. Soon after, the fortress doors were breached, and Ludwin, along with his royal guard, marched out, overwhelming Carmine's forces. The remaining soldiers retreated, unable to match the strength of Salma's army. Inside Randall Castle, some of the corrupt leaders who had sided with Carmine began to doubt his leadership, accusing him of being too weak to command his army. But Carmine, showing his fierce lion-like face, confidently reminded them that he still had the upper hand in the war boasting that his forces outnumbered Salma's. The wealthy nobles, realizing their mistake, quickly apologized for doubting Carmine's abilities. However, Carmine, unimpressed, ordered them to leave his castle, telling them to let the real fighters handle the war. Back in Altamura, Mayor Weiss returned to face Gaius and his soldiers. In a fit of fear, the cowardly mayor broke down, admitting he had failed to convince the citizens to peacefully surrender. Gaius, ever impatient, drew his sword and was ready to execute Weiss on the spot. But Julius intervened, advising his father that it would be smarter to negotiate with Weiss instead of killing him outright. Weiss, seizing the opportunity, dropped several bags of gold at Gaius's feet, swearing once again that he would deliver the city to them by the next afternoon. What Gaius and his army didn't realize was that Weiss had been secretly collaborating with Excel Walter, whom Salma had sent to Altamura three days before the civil war began. Though Weiss complained about the money spent to stall Gaius's army, Excel assured him that this delay was vital to giving Salma more time to prepare. Meanwhile, at the fortress, Keed rested her head on Halbert's shoulder, telling him that she would love him no matter how the war ended. The next day, Carmine's forces resumed their assault on the fortress. To Halbert's shock, dozens of dragons from Duke Castor's army began flying overhead. The night before, in Varga's castle, Castor's assistant, Tallman, had informed him that all preparations had been made for their attack on Salma. Castor, however, surprised Tallman by stating that he would be facing Salma alone, as he had refused to align himself with the corrupt nobles who supported Carmine. Just then, Carla entered the throne room, reporting that Salma's ship, accompanied by a squad of war rhinos, would soon arrive at the castle gates. Castor, skeptical, looked through his telescope and was astonished to see Elfreden's best battleship being rolled toward the castle on wheels. Connecting with Salma via the gemstone broadcaster, Castor demanded an explanation. Salma calmly informed him that he planned to use the warship to take over the entire dragon state. Impressed by Salma's tactics, Castor was still unwilling to surrender. He ordered Carla to gather her dragon squad to take down Salma's warship. The dragon riders, aboard their massive creatures, launched an aerial assault on the warship. Just as they were about to drop bombs, Salma's men attacked with magical heat-sensing missiles, taking out many of the dragons. Changing tactics, the dragon riders flew lower, targeting the ship's wheels and weapons with fire. But when they realized there was no one aboard, Carla understood they had been tricked. Salma had used the ship as a distraction to lure them away from the castle, allowing him and his team to launch a surprise attack on Castor himself. Salma and his group ambushed Castor inside the castle. Shocked, the Duke asked how they managed to infiltrate. Salma explained that he had studied the history of Varga's castle from books, learning every secret passageway. Impressed by Salma's intellect, Castor asked the king to spare his royal advisor, Talman, and make him the new head of the Air Force if he was defeated. Salma offered Castor one final chance to surrender, but the stubborn Duke refused, drawing his sword. Ready to defend her king, Aisha unsheathed her elf blade and prepared to fight Castor. The duke mocked Salma for not fighting him directly, calling him a coward. Aisha, insulted by his tone, slashed at Castor, but he blocked her attack with his sword. She tried to deliver a powerful strike, but Castor skillfully deflected her move, pushing her back. Smirking, Castor taunted Aisha, saying, You're too hot to handle. Aisha didn't appreciate Castor's jokes and, with a powerful swipe, sent him crashing against the wall. She declared that she would protect Salma with her life. Castor mocked her, saying she was too weak to be anyone's bodyguard, continuing to slash at her. Just as he was about to land a finishing blow, Nabu suddenly appeared, blocking Castor's strike. 
Right behind Nabu, Lysia arrived and trapped the Duke with her Ice Sword Jutsu. Aisha completed the combo with a supersonic wind blade technique that shattered the ice, sending Castor crashing to the ground and admitting defeat. Castor asked Lysia if Salma was truly fit to be king. Lysia confidently replied that Salma was a wise and capable leader, one she would always stand by. She then placed a magical collar around Castor's neck to prevent his escape. When Carla returned and attempted to attack, Castor stopped her, admitting their defeat. Carla, reluctantly, allowed Aisha to place a collar on her as well. Salma then appointed Talman as the new general of the Air Force and ordered him to send the Dragon Knights to Carmine's territory. Meanwhile, back at the fortress, Halbert and Keed were prepared to surrender, thinking Carmine's men had them outnumbered. However, they realized the dragons were on their side, meaning Salma's plan had worked. Halbert and Salma greeted each other like old friends. Inside Randall Castle, the corrupt nobles grew increasingly anxious due to Salma's relentless attacks. They urged Carmine to take action, but after assessing the dire state of their army with his military assistant, Carmine decided it was time to surrender to King Salma. The cowardly nobles, desperate, suggested using the citizens as human shields. Furious, Carmine ordered his men to collar the nobles and instructed his assistant to place a collar around his own neck as well. He then appointed Beowulf to take command of the army and deliver him, along with the captured nobles, to Salma's forces. Later, while sulking over a bottle of PG grape juice, Carmine was informed by Beowulf that Salma had left Randall Castle without capturing him. Puzzled, Carmine wondered why Salma had chosen not to take him prisoner. Salma later explained to Carla that he had once viewed Carmine as his greatest enemy, but after talking to Halbert's father, Glaive, his perspective changed. Glaive revealed that Carmine had sided with the corrupt nobles as part of a larger plan to gather them in one place, making it easier for the kingdom to capture them all. Salma was surprised by the revelation, and Glaive further explained that Carmine had convinced the nobles to invest all their hidden wealth in hiring soldiers from the nation of Zm. Carmine's plan had been to capture both the nobles and the hired soldiers, recovering the money in the process. Salma, astonished by Carmine's forward-thinking strategy, asked why the Duke had gone to such lengths. Glaive simply replied that Carmine had faith in Salma's leadership and believed he was the right person to guide the kingdom forward. Back at Altamira, the Amanian army was preparing to attack the city when Julius noticed someone standing on the walls. Gaius was shocked to see that it was Excel Walter. Wondering how she had arrived so quickly, Julius deduced that she must have been in the city all along, siding with Salma. He advised his father to retreat, but Gaius, not wanting to appear cowardly, refused. Excel then used her magic to create a water screen, projecting Salma's speech to the people of Alfredon. In the speech, Salma announced that both Carmine and Castor had been defeated in the Civil War, and that Amania, led by Gaius, was planning to invade Elfreden due to its involvement in the conflict. Salma officially declared war on Amania, revealing that he had already sent forces to attack their capital. Panicked, Gaius ordered his troops to march back to Amania immediately. However, during their night journey through the valleys, they were ambushed by a group of masked archers, led by Juna herself. The attack severely weakened the Amanian forces, cutting their numbers in half. When Gaius and the remnants of his army finally reached the capital city of Van, he was stunned to see Alfred and banners mounted all over the city. Julius tried to reassure his father, pointing out that Amanian flags still flew over the castle, meaning Salma hadn't completely taken the city yet. Determined, Gaius ordered his remaining soldiers to launch a full-scale attack on the invaders. Salma, receiving word of Gaius's plan, gave Ludwin and the others permission to fight back. As the two armies clashed, Salma remained at the Elfreden battle camp, planning his next moves with Carla. He expressed his willingness to die for his kingdom if things went awry. But when Carla asked if he feared death, Salma realized he was just bluffing. As the battle raged on, Gaius told Julius to escape, insisting that they had already lost the war and that Salma would target the royal family first. Julius tried to convince his father to retreat together, but Gaius ordered him to leave and preserve their bloodline, expecting his own defeat. Meanwhile, one of Salma's soldiers reported that Gaius and his army were charging straight toward their camp. Salma, preparing for the worst, instructed Carla to hand over the kingdom to Lycia if he didn't survive. Carla, however, refused to deliver such devastating news and offered to fight in his place. Salma agreed, allowing Carla to engage Gaius directly. As the Amanian army advanced, Ludwin threw his spear at Gaius, but realized too late that it was just a clone. The real Gaius appeared, and Carla descended to face him. Despite her best efforts, the crazed warlord began to overpower her. Just when it seemed Gaius would strike a fatal blow, Nabu arrived, using his spear to block the attack. 
Salma suddenly appeared, accusing Gaius of being an imposter for invading their land. In rage, Gaius attempted to behead Salma, but Nabu grabbed his arm, holding him in place. Salma then ordered Carla to ignite his ninja doll with her fire magic. The result was a massive explosion that engulfed Gaius in flames and knocked Carla to the ground. While Salma was checking on Carla after the explosion, they were both shocked to see that Gaius was still alive, marching forward despite his severe injuries and the loss of most of his armor. The archers fired multiple arrows into his wounded body, but with his last bit of strength, Gaius threw his sword at Salma, landing it just inches from the king's foot. With Gaius finally down, Salma and his team took control of Van Castle. As they explored the castle, Lycia noticed that Amania had spent a significant amount of money on creating an extravagant world stand in the throne room. Ludwin informed Salma that Gaius's son, Julius, had escaped during the battle, along with Gaius's daughter, Roroa, and the former minister of finance, Colbert. Poncho pointed out that Amania had more weapons than food, so Salma decided they would sell off the surplus weapons to generate funds for the basic needs of the people. Glaive then reported that their forces were ready to occupy all of Amania, but Salma immediately called for an end to the war, warning that the Chaos Empire was likely to intervene soon. Lycia was surprised, but Salma explained that, according to the peace treaty set by the Chaos Empire, their kingdom could be considered rebels for invading Amania. He instructed everyone to begin cleaning up the destruction caused by the war in the city. As Ludwin walked through the streets, he noticed that many citizens still harbored hatred toward Alfred. Later in the day, Juna arrived, and Salma thanked her for her help while complimenting her naval uniform. This made Lycia a bit jealous, but Aisha gently stroked her head to calm her down. Salma explained that he needed Juna's exceptional singing skills to help unite the people of Elfriden and Amania through the power of entertainment. A transparent screen appeared in the city center, ready for the live performance. Just before the show began, Aisha suddenly experienced stage fright and began to shiver, but Salma reassured her, telling her that she looked beautiful in her dress. Together, they walked onto the stage and announced the first performer, a young girl named Pamel who sang a heartwarming lullaby that brought smiles to the faces of the audience. Next up was Juna, who dazzled the crowd with her performance. While Juna was singing, Salma pulled Aisha aside, instructing her to stay vigilant, as the next performer could be dangerous. The crowd cheered as Juna finished her song, and Salma introduced the next singer, Margarita, a soldier who would be performing the Amanian anthem. Margarita's passionate rendition of the anthem stirred deep emotions in the crowd. After her performance, she approached Salma, asking him to execute her for committing treason. However, Salma refused, telling her that executing someone for simply singing a song would be absurd. He declared that his mission was to build a unified kingdom where everyone could freely express themselves. Meanwhile, at the Grand Chaos Empire, Jean Euphoria, leader of the armed forces, informed her sister, Maria, the queen of the empire, of her plans to visit Amania and meet Salma. Maria expressed confidence that Salma would readily relinquish his claim to Amania, but Jean wasn't so sure. Unlike her sister, she viewed the hero king as a hardcore realist who might have his own plans in mind. After Salma took on the role of ruler of Amania, his workload doubled, as he now had to manage the affairs of citizens from both Elfriden and Amania. Lycia mentioned that there had been an influx of requests for live television shows and outdoor events ever since Salma encouraged the citizens to express themselves freely. After filing a mountain of documents, Salma received a call from Hakuya, informing him that a battalion from the Chaos Empire, led by Jean Euphoria, would be visiting Amania soon. Salma thanked him for the warning. Shortly after, Poncho arrived with something important to show Salma. He revealed a white flower from a bag, calling it the Mysterious Lily. Poncho explained that the flower's fragrance could put anyone into a deep sleep, which prompted Salma to ask him to remove it immediately. However, Poncho reassured him that he had drained the pollen from this one, rendering it harmless. Poncho then showed Salma the plant's root, which excited the king. When Lycia asked why he was so thrilled, Salma explained that the lily root was an excellent source of carbohydrates, although Lycia still seemed puzzled. Poncho further revealed that there were many mysterious lily plants growing in the rocky regions of Amania and Salma was pleased, as it would help address the nation's food shortage. Salma then asked how they could safely harvest the lily root without getting drowsy. Poncho explained that there was a tribe in the Chaos Empire that used trained orangutans to harvest the crop. When Salma inquired if there were any orangutans in the region, 
Poncho informed him that they had spotted some in the mountains, and that Tama was currently negotiating with the monkeys. Impressed by the clever solution, Salma instructed Poncho to proceed with the harvest. Soon after, Poncho and Serena began serving lily root dumplings and naan in the market square, delighting the citizens with the new food options. The next day, Salma decided to go undercover with Juna and Tama to explore the city of Van. As they wandered through the bustling streets, Tama was fascinated by the variety of shops selling beautiful items. Along the way, Juna playfully held Salma's hand like a cheeky girlfriend, adding a light-hearted touch to their undercover adventure. After asking for advice on where to visit first, Juna suggested they head to a fancy clothing store so that Salma could buy a nice gift for Tamo. Once inside, Salma encouraged Tamo to pick anything she liked, and Juna eagerly helped her choose something trendy. While the girls enjoyed their shopping, the store owner approached Salma and offered some advice. If he ever wanted to win an argument against a woman, he should wait to bring up his ideas at the last minute. Salma, amused by the advice, realized that it would be better to give Tomo the pair of shoes he was holding as a surprise gift later. When they left the store, Salma handed Tomo the shoes, and she thanked him, her eyes welling up with tears. To show his appreciation for her constant support, Salma also brought out a gift for Juna. When he placed a ladybug hairpin in her hair, Juna blushed shyly, much like a young girl. They continued their walk, stopping to buy some delicious lily dumplings, and sat on a park bench to enjoy them. Afterward, Tomo dozed off on Salma's lap, looking like a sweet little sister. However, their peaceful moment was cut short by the sudden appearance of Jean Euphoria from the Chaos Empire. She approached them and asked for a few minutes of their time. Salma, caught off guard, remarked that it was bold of her to visit Amania while he was still in charge. Jean explained that she had come to see if the legendary hero king lived up to the stories she'd heard. She then teased Salma, saying she had also heard rumors that he had a weakness for beautiful women, and she hinted that her sister, Maria, planned to use her charm to convince Salma. However, Salma denied Jean's claims, and Jean expressed her respect for his leadership style, saying he knew how to connect with his people. When she asked about his innovative ideas like the Gemstone live shows, Salma explained that such things already existed in his home world. Jean, recalling his otherworldly origins, apologized for the Chaos Empire's involvement in summoning him. Salma assured her that he had moved past it long ago. Jean thanked him for taking the throne from Lycia's father and for handling the kingdom's debt, but Salma replied that he was simply doing his duty as king. Despite their mutual respect, Jean reminded him that his actions in Amania were violating parts of their treaty, and they would need to discuss Amania's future in a formal meeting. Back at the castle, Tomo proudly showed off the dress Salma had bought her, while Salma gifted Aisha a fancy lip gloss and gave Lycia a silver necklace. Looking at them, Salma realized how proud his grandfather would have been of the family he had built. And that's where this video end, watch the next one and, and I will see you in the next one.